Good evening, everybody. Thank you um, very much for, for joining tonight. It's wonderful to see a, to see a full, full room here. Um, my name is Philip Vassiliou. I am the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Legatum Capital, so the investment side of uh, the Legatum Group's business. Um, and as part of that role, I'm also a, a partner in the group um, and very actively involved in, in the Legatum Foundation. Um, the foundation has been around for about 15 years now. Uh, we've funded probably over around 1,000 uh, grassroots community-based organizations all around the world during that time, uh, including the Ubuntu Education Fund. Um, and one of the big initiatives that we have as a group as well, obviously, is to, to, to help support and fund uh, the Legatum Institute where uh, we are tonight. Um, very passionate about the Legatum Institute and the role that uh, the Institute plays, not just as part of the group, but in the world at large, um, because we firmly believe, I think, as a group, that uh, after we're all passed on to another life and after the capital is spent, the one thing that has the ability to endure are the ideas. Um, and the ideas that the Legatum Institute are focused on are some that we care very deeply um, about. And I guess it's a good segue into the panel that, uh, that we're here tonight for, um, which is around changing the conversation in philanthropy. Um, and I've had the pleasure of knowing kind of Jacob Leaf, the, the founder and the chief executive officer of the Ubuntu Education Fund for the last 25 years um, as a friend. Uh, and I've also been on the board of the Ubuntu Education Fund for the last seven or eight years now. Um, and I guess as, as, as that friendship has evolved over the years um, and as my role with the Ubuntu Education Fund uh, has taken on kind of a greater meaning uh, to me uh, and more of my time, uh, I've had the chance to watch the organization and watch kind of Jacob flourish. And uh, the thing that's most impressed me over, over that time is not just the good uh, that the fund, the, the Ubuntu Education Fund has achieved, and that's having changed you know, what, what are now thousands of lives. But I think the thing for me that stands out is, is the great. Um, and the great when it comes to, to Jacob and, and Ubuntu is this idea around um, you know, what an organization should look like that is a community-based organization that thinks about uh, impact in a very different way. And uh, what that's not about to, to Jacob is scale. It's not about how many thousands of people Jacob and the fund touches. It's about really going much deeper in a community, really focusing the resources of the fund uh, for a small number of people and actually changing their life. And, and what does that mean? So the conversation tonight, obviously you'll get to hear a little bit about Jacob's story, um, but we're also really honored to have Matthew Bishop, um, one, of, uh, one of the most influential writers around philanthropy and, and business, a uh, longtime writer of, at The Economist um, and co-author of Philanthropic Capitalism. So I can think of no better people to, to help lead a conversation um, around kind of what the future of philanthropy looks like and, and get some interesting insights um, from Jacob and Matthew um, from their experiences, but the hope is to have a little bit of a discussion around those uh, around that topic. And so, after about 20 or 30 minutes of uh, of conversation, the hope is to have some Q and A and have have other people not just ask questions, but also kind of share some of their insights and some of their uh, their thoughts from uh, from their experiences. So, on behalf of of the Legatum Group, thank you all for 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 joining. Um, after after about. Uh, an hour of, uh, of this conversation. We'd love to invite you next door as well for, for a drink and just to, to continue the conversation. But uh, um, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for coming. And over to Matthew and Jacob. Well, thank you very much. And uh, um, you kindly mentioned Philanthropic Capitalism, my book at the start. And um, I mean, one of the, the core themes of that book and the reason I'm so interested to talk with Jake today is this question of, you know, we all know that philanthropy is on the rise. It's become you know, one of the things that you do as you become more successful in, in today's society. Um, but so much of that philanthropy, it seems to me, is, is, is wasted um, on ineffective uh, solutions or attempts to solve problems that don't really ever have a chance of really making a big difference. And what I love doing when I talk to people like Jake is, is identifying uh, good organizations that could be models for others but also deserve to, to be supported. And the question with philanthropic capitalism is how do we get the best ideas to get 
the money that they need to actually succeed, um, which is a fairly simple question, but remarkable in uh, its lack of connection with what's actually happening in the real world of philanthropy too often. And so hopefully we're going to come back and talk a lot about that question today. Um, but let's start with, um, with Jay, who it turns out, Philip mentioned in the, in the introduction uh, that they've known each other 25 years. It turns out that Philip and, uh, and Jake were at school together uh, in London 25 years ago. And this is actually very important, it, it turns out, in the early history of Ubuntu. So tell us a bit about how it all got right. started. All right. So I'm American, and uh, my family moved to London. I was 12, 13 years old and started getting into a lot of trouble. And I came across this march one day, and it was a Free Mandela march. I had no connection to South Africa. I'd never been to the continent. And I was just caught up in the euphoria, the colors, the music. And before I know it, I was volunteering. And then when I was 17, three, four years later, I got a chance with 15 students from uh, 15 different countries here in the UK. We all traveled to South Africa to observe the country's transition to democracy. And we spent six weeks meeting with everyone from your uh, Robben Island freedom fighters, those who spent their life in jail with Nelson Mandela and so forth, all the way through to your right-wing, neo-Nazi, Eugene Tarabalanches, and everyone in between. And one evening, and I tell this story because it really ch changed my life, and it was the moment that I knew I wanted to be a part of what they were calling New South Africa. We were dropped off one evening um, in an area called Alexandria. And Alexandria is shacks, as far as you can see, and it sits in the shadows of Santon, which looks like um, the city here, big skyscrapers. It's the economic hub of the continent. And I was, met this woman, and she was quite large and quite old. And you're 17, you think you know everything. And I said to her, and she's telling me how she uh, just waited 30 hours to cast her ballot. And you're 17, I'm like, what, what are you talking I just came out. What are you talking about? You waited seven, uh, 30 hours. And she tapped me on my shoulder and said, no, boy, you don't understand. I've waited 85 years. And she walked away. And I never saw that lady again. But it was that moment when I said I wanted to be a part of this new South Africa. And so I followed a woman who was working on the Constitution there, who was a professor in the United States, a law professor, to the University of Pennsylvania. And I arrived there. And a year within that year, we got internet on our campus. And I found a job in Cape Town. And I convinced this woman to sponsor me to go back. And so I head down to Cape Town. Now it's a few years later. It's 1998. And I arrived to no job. It was a complete scam. And I'm thinking, I'm down here now for six months. What am I going to do? And I lasted 12 hours. I got on a train and left Cape Town. And on this train ride, I met a guy who convinced me to get off in a place called Port Elizabeth, South Africa, a very industrial coastal city there. And he said, why don't you come and have a beer with me? I was 20 years old at the time. We go into this little tavern in the middle of the townships. And it's seen in the movies. Everything goes quiet. And everyone looks at me. And the music stops. And I'm thinking, OK, this is the end of me. And I mean, a white guy symbolized everything wrong in the country. And um, one guy in the corner of this smoky little tavern or shack invites me over. And we start talking. and. He's a school teacher. I told him I need a job. I was not involved in social work and education, but I needed something to do. And he said, why don't you come work in my school? I said, sure, but I need a place to live. And I moved in with his family. So those six months I lived in this community, I saw all of this philanthropic money pouring in, a lot of EU money, a lot of sort of these large foundations from Washington, DC, New York coming in. Um, and one by one, they'd come through this region, and everyone defines success by how many X they'd hand out, how many cups of soup, how many library books, how many wind-up computers, none of it. And then they'd move on. And I'm looking at these young girls who've been raped, who are living in a shack, and we're telling these new generations of South Africans, hey, you could go to university. There's freedom. You can do whatever you want. But the truth is, a wind-up computer and a cup of soup isn't going to change your life. And that was really what sort of began my thinking of how to start an organization. And went back to university after six months, held a raffle. And back then, they used to have credit cards away on our campus. I took eight of them, graduated from university. And we started Ubuntu Education Fund. And the idea was we drew a seven-kilometer zone around a community of about 350,000 people. But I wanted to work with not the top academic kids, but the kids who've been raped, the kids who lost their parents, the bottom of the bottom. And I wanted to prove if you invest in these children the same way someone invested in me, they can make it out. Jump, you know, 17 years later, we have what we call this cradle to career model where we actually start with pregnant moms because we know most of the world parenting begins when a child's born. Truth is, it doesn't, and the research is rock hard behind this. It be and if you don't get it right in the womb, you're in these type of communities, you're just never going to catch up. Ensure a healthy birth from an HIV positive mother, and then we work with these kids every day of your lives. 
And the end goal is age 16, we put them into two tracks, our university or non-university, and we get them into employment at the end of the day. And you know, everyone's always asking, well, Jake, what's your exit strategy? There's no exit strategy with raising children, I'll tell you that much. You're with these kids every day. Um, and that's, I think, uh, what differentiates us in its real sustainability. So, I mean, let's start with the, the sort of the, the biggest question that people ask about um, foreigners intervening in another country and coming with aid and so forth. Sure. I mean, that, that whether they call it the white savior complex or, or just simply you know, dead aid, as Dan B. Samoyo put it. I mean, do, do, how, how do you, having done what you've done for the last 17 years, how do you respond to those kinds of criticisms that this is all either inappropriate or a waste, a waste of money? I think if it's done thoughtfully and well it, from the bottom up, it works. So we, um, my partner, uh, Man Banks, who I ended up living with and started this organization with, um, is the co-founder. Our 98% of our staff come from our communities. Now these are people under the age of 40 who made it out, who um, have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, charter accountants, lawyers, and all the money we raise goes into compensation. It's competing. We don't need more program supplies. We need good people to raise our kids. And um, if you're black and well-educated in South Africa, you make a boatload in the private sector. So I think having one is key is the staff. Our team comes from our communities. Uh, two is where we're located. We're located in the heart of all of um, this poverty, right in the middle. And we, um, in 2005, we set out to build what we call the Ubuntu Center. Um, it is just a building, but it symbolizes everything we believe in. This idea that access to you know, quality health care and great education should be a child's right, not a privilege. So when we set out to build, it's a $7 million center, which in South Africa is an extraordinary amount of money. And I wanted to win our Global Architecture Awards. I wanted to build something that had never been seen before. And everyone who's criticizing, well, that's Jake's Fanny project. I remember a, a breakfast I gave on the um, Upper West Side of Manhattan. We were trying to raise money for this. And, this woman kept saying, well, how dare you spend $7 million when there's so much poverty? And I said, well, do you have children? She said, yeah. And I said, did they go to school? She said, of course. And I said, where? She said, Dalton. It's a $50,000 a year primary school. So it's okay for you to send your own child to a $50,000, but I can't you know, send my, uh, a black child in South Africa to a center of excellence. And that's a shift. And I'm dealing with the good people, right? And so we're trying to shift people's thinking of, let's not ask how you do for cheaper. Let's ask what it actually costs to take a child out of poverty. Um, what's the best we can provide for these children and for the same dignity that you'd afford your own family? You know, our, the first 222,000 rand we raised for this building came from our community and coins. So it's community owned. It's, um, we're as grassroots as anything you'd find. And when I say grassroots, most people in this room probably think of fiscal mismanagement, inefficiency, and so forth. The truth is grassroots, when it works, is spectacular. It's the ideas are generated at the bottom, but we've been able to uh, reconcile that with sort of global best practices, partly because of this dynamics between me and the, the founder. So, I mean, I mean you, you, you're claiming that this is a very different approach that works. What's the evidence so far that you've got that, you know, this grassroots approach actually does deliver you know, real change in people's lives? I think it's less about the grassroots uh, approach as much as just about the sustained intervention. You know, being with these children, we found that it takes 48 to 52 months to take a child who's been raped um, and get them to a point where they can actually be part of a community again, but can begin to gain academic success. So that's a, that's, that's a long time. Now, you know, when we used to go after a lot of the sort of large bilateral government funding, they used to say, well, to count a child as one child, you have to hit a thousand children in counseling, and a child, to count a child once, it takes five counseling sessions. And I'm thinking, okay, and I remember this. Uh, USAID account manager coming to us and saying, well, you're not going to hit your target for the year. You know, you've got to go quicker. And I'm saying, God forbid your own child was abused. You know, five counseling sessions doesn't do it. So I use that as an example to show that our, we've, we ended up turning down a huge amount of money over the years. We've now turned down almost eight million US dollars to stay focused. And we're with these kids every day. Um, we're able to track their progress. Our kids um, matriculate at 72% rate from high school compared to 37% in the region. Our, we have an adherence rate to our HIV drugs for our young mothers of 96% compared to 56% in the, in the larger region. And I use that because the key to keeping a child safe is keeping a mother alive and healthy. The middle of the mom passes on is where you see um, a home turn upside down. That's where kids move into survival mode, transactional sex, cr uh, crime, anything to survive. So we use some of these key indicators and we try to compare ourselves to what's happening in the region, the larger country, and we're outperforming in just about every area. So, I mean, when you, 
Um, when you say you turn money down, well, what's the basis on which you turn money down? Because this is almost unheard of in the philanthropic sector. I mean, no. usually you will contort yourself any number of ways um, in order to take whatever money is available. So it's from... been an interesting journey. So I was 20 when I started this, and I had really long hair, and no one... It's you know... the book you're described as blonde-haired at one point by Desmond Tutu, no <laughs> <it's>... <laughs> It's not blonde? No, a little bit. <laughs> so, but I was 21, and I realized quickly to play, to be recognized in this field, to, it was such hard work. And we don't talk enough about how much of this doesn't work. I mean, if you go to, any, go to Davos and everyone was doing half of what they said they'd be doing, there'd be no poverty in the world. And we need to create an environment, we can talk about this a little later, where hmm. we can talk honestly about how much of this, how hard this is. Um, and so, you know, when I was 21, I wanted to be recognized. I, I wanted to. Get, be at Davos. I want to be at Clinton Initiative. I want to be at Skoll. And so you had a, we just started designing programs that were, we went against what we knew best. We started designing programs that were output driven so we could claim to reach 40, 50,000 people, touch the lives. And we were doing it, it wasn't a lie. And all of a sudden, within two years, we were raising eight, nine million dollars a year. I was on the stage at Davos, I was on the stage at Clinton Initiative. And then I looked at our kids and I'm like, we're not doing anything for them. We're not having any impact on these kids. We're giving, we, 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 it's everything. And so we quickly started to weed ourselves off this money, started to turn down this money. Um, and we started to say to ourselves, you know, if I was a for-profit company in Silicon Valley, a, a startup, I'd ask myself, who do I want to be my investors? What kind of people do I want investing in us? So we've, we're down to a five million, five and a half million dollar US dollar budget right now, all unrestricted, all um, mostly high net individuals or family foundations. Um, and we are doing more with five and a half million dollars than we're doing with a nine million dollar budget. Now we're trying to sort of do, engage in a huge growth strategy where we'll target more individuals, more unrestricted money, people who understand that um, we need to spend money on people. That's not an overhead cost. That's, that's how we grow our company, by investing in human beings. Um, so I, mean, you know, I, I think I see your organization in a similar light to, to say, Paul Farmer's um, Partners in Health, in that, that both are, from one point of view, they're, they're kind of Rolls-Royce projects. I mean, that, that would be the, the critique that you would get from some people that would say that these, these are brilliant, but you, you know, you're, you're picking a few thousand people in a small part of, of Africa, and you know, that, that's a drop in the ocean compared to the scale of the problem, and therefore, somehow that's a bad thing. So um, I have two children home. My mm -hmm. wife's uh, university educated. I am. We're, we're barely surviving. We're barely making with two kids. Right. And we have, our children have every ac resource they could possibly need. Mm -hmm. So when I hear organizations tell me they're reaching 100,000, 50,000, I just sort of chuckle. They're giving one-off interventions. So if I can take 2,000 children who are going down a path to poverty, to death, to crime, and actually get them into well-paying jobs, healthy, and good citizenship, something we talk a lot about. I believe that could change the entire world. Now, now do you mean, I mean, do, do, does that mean that you would, given there's a fixed budget, or, or, we, or there seems to be a fixed budget of money around in, from governments and private individuals to actually address you know, poverty outside of our own doorsteps? I mean, would you prefer a strategy that says, let's be selective and just pick a group and do it properly, and even though we recognize that's going to, you know, we're, we're going to drop the, the, the pretense that we're ever going to help most people. So when I speak to philanthropists, that's what I always encourage, is choose what are you interested in, whether it's a sector, whether it's, what, whether it's a, a geography, whether it's one organization. Go deep into that. Get involved. Provide the resources they need to actually to leverage their own organization to have that impact. You know, we, um, we talk about turning down money. So um, a couple of hedge fund managers approached us about three years ago, and I write about this in the book and um, offered me $10 million to build an, an Ubuntu center in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is just north of Greenwich, Connecticut, apparently the third poorest zip code in America. I don't know if that's true or not. And we popped the champagne. We were so excited. We thought, this is amazing. And then by that evening, I was so depressed. I'm like, I don't know that community. I have no connection to it. And we, all, we ended up saying no. But it, gave, it started this journey of really exploring how do we take what we've learned over 17 years um, and package it in a meaningful way to share with others. And I've landed on this word of leverage instead of scale, which um, I've seen very few things scaled well. Um, how do we take this in? We, I started looking a lot at the franchising model. The chairman of our board uh, made his money in franchising. And I've learned a lot about system building and so forth. 
But when you look, you can get a Starbucks latte anywhere in the world, but it's still a Starbucks latte. Mm -hmm. And I want to be the boutique artisanal coffee shop in a lot of ways. And so we fell on this idea of building a institute where we could identify entrepreneurs who are committed to specific communities, right? And I don't think we, we, we never hear anything in this, this whole sector talk about institution building. Because at the end of the day, if you want to study public health, Paul Farmer does it better than we do. If you want to study global education, there are, I can give you a whole list of people who do it better than us. But we've built a thriving institution in the middle of a disadvantaged community. You look at disadvantaged communities all around the world, whether it's here in the UK, overseas, anywhere, if they're missing in thriving, well-run, efficient community institutions that are the backbone of successful communities. And we want to create an institute that will help entrepreneurs develop and really get in bed with them, help them realize their own vision, but connect it to specific communities. I think that would be a really unique and different way of uh, and leveraging our knowledge base after 17 years. So just to, to push you a bit, what, how would you d distinguish between leverage and scale? And you made that point earlier. What, does it, what do you mean by that? scale would be trying to help others create Ubuntu centers, right? I think leverage would be like take, helping what we've, take what we've learned and literally get in bed with these young entrepreneurs for a mentorship, join their board, help find them access to funding, um, and help them navigate all the pitfalls, everything that we've encountered over the last 17 years to build bottom-up institutions. And you think it's very similar to scale? Or? Well, it's... Uh... I suppose for me, scale, the, the issue with scale is, you know, the world is about to agree these sustainable development goals in, in New York this September, which, you know, The Economist, where I work, has, has been quite skeptical about that. You know, there's 169 targets. We've said maybe 169 is worse than none at all because it's so diffuse. But, I mean, fundamentally, the world is going to agree this incredibly idealistic scenario for 15 years' time. And... You know, the, the, I suppose the question of scale is how do we how do we achieve you know, uh, something that that lifts all all people's lives out of out of poverty? And you know, the question is, with, with something like what you're doing, to what extent is is it a model that can be adopted widely and and and, and raise so many other people out of out of um, out of poverty, or or is it something that? I think what we're in, doing in, is, inherently has to stay small, and in, in that case, what do we do about all the rest of the people? I think what we're doing is applicable anywhere in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's an old recipe of how you raise a child. You know, we're all sitting at these conferences looking for these great new innovations and solutions. The truth is, I bet everyone in this room probably has a good idea how to raise a child, whether they have their own children or not. You, right? If you don't say to a child who can't see the blackboard, you don't say to them, well, we're not a vision parent or vision organization, you buy them glasses. Mm. And I hear too many organizations say, well, we have to find an organ a group that does vision to get you glasses. I'm like, well, you know, we're just so confused. And I believe it comes back to the dynamics between the funders or the, 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 the capital and the organizations, which feeds right into your book. Hmm. And it's this unhealthy dynamic of, you know, we're supposed to change a child's life in 12 months in a grant cycle. You can't do that. It takes a long time. We need um, organizations to take more risk with the groups they're funding to allow people to fail. I mean, I, I mentioned Silicon Valley. I said this when we spoke a couple weeks ago. When, you know, I spend a lot of time out there and everyone's running around talking about their failures and how many startups they had that didn't work. And that's like a badge of honor you wear. In my sector, nobody talks about it. I can't, if I stood up at a Davos and just talked, it's unheard of. And we're starting to see little bits in, you know, of this, but we need to create an environment where we can take more risk. Where, um, and what's interesting is a lot of these new philanthropists have made their money in technologies that um, th there was a lot of failure to lead up to that. And uh, we need to create a better environment to do that. So, so can our say, model, so, yeah. coming back to our model, um, I don't think we could do ours bigger. And I think that's OK. But I think we can create it. Um, the idea with the Institute is to train others to do this same concept. I mean, I, the guy who mentored me is a guy named Jeffrey Canada, who starts something called the Harlem Children's Zone in uh, Upper Manhattan, New York. Um, I'll never forget the day, it was about, he'd been into it 12 years. Now he invests close to $100 million a year in 100 square blocks, they call it, okay? And it was one of these days uh, when I was just pulling my hair out and everything was going wrong. And uh, he was the one, and he said to me, I want to show you something. And he brings me to his clinic. And I'm like, oh, are these your high school students? He goes, no, these are our parents. And there were young girls who were pregnant. And he said, if you don't start with young pregnant women, and I was like, but how many kids have you gotten after you've been doing this 15 years? How many kids have gotten to university? And he said, 237. And my reaction is probably like yours. After 15 years spending much money, you're like, oh, that's not a lot. 
truth is, is that this generational poverty is so deep. These problems are so complex. And we have to start early. We have to stick with these children and their families. I mean, the core to our business, which I didn't even touch on, is stabilizing the home. There's no point in investing a child and sending them home every day to an environment where they're being abused. There's no roof over their head. Mm. There's not enough food. Um, so it's a really 360 approach to it. So talk about you know, what, what's your badge of failure that you, if you were in Silicon Valley, you know, in your case, what, what would be the example you would tell? My, my favorite one, the, how I thought I could, um, Ubuntu Education Fund's our name. It's probably not a, the best name, but for what we actually do. We decided we would build the capacity of schools. Um, for the first five years, that's all we did. We invested in, in local primary and high schools. We would train teachers. We'd build centers of excellence, computer centers, technology labs, uh, science rooms, uh, physical education rooms. Um, what I quickly realized is we have no accountability. They, they, we can't hold these teachers accountable. The unions are too strong. In South Africa, for example, the, um, you know, this, I'm dealing with teachers who had what they called a, a teaching diploma in the old system, which is really nothing more than a glorified high school degree. None of them could pass the exam to go into university themselves, yet they're teaching kids. It was a huge train wreck, and for us to have to admit that after our first five years that we probably had zero impact, but we learned a lot. And we pulled all of our money, all of our resources out of the schools, and we run direct services ourselves. Because I can, if you give me money, I can tell you what's happening or what's not happening. I can be held accountable. And how did your funders react to that? It was hard. It was really hard, and because you're five years into it, everyone, and this is still a period where we're not talking at all about this stuff, right? So this is, we're, we're going back, to, I started this officially in 1999, so we're talking 2003, 2004, um, and people sort of question why they should continue investing in us, um, but a lot of it is communication, and you know, we um, spend a lot of time with our investors, our donors, just telling them how much of this doesn't work, convincing them to fly down to Port Elizabeth, let us take you and see this environment. We can only control what we can control, something we speak a lot about. And that's hard for our, uh, the foundation world, the philanthropy world to understand. Um, you know, I'll tell a story of a young, um, three young kids who've been with us. Uh, they lost their parents to HIV within six months, and they've been with us for uh, over 12 years. The middle sister, um, on and off track, and that's really, we have a whole sort of um, algorithm which tells if a child's on or off track, and that's how we, obviously on track's one of these kids. We finally get this young woman on track, she's at university, and um, she was raped on a Friday night at a tavern. And I'll never forget what, uh, one of our um, big donors who knows this young woman well said to me, what the hell is she doing at a tavern? And I said, hold on, when you were in university at 19, that's where you were. And this young girl was doing nothing wrong, was in a place with illicit drugs, she wasn't, and she wasn't even drinking, and this horrible thing happened to her, which has nothing to do with her fault, and she fell back off track, obviously. And it's taken us another three years to get her to a point where she's on track. It's what you do with your own children. Um, and it's communication, and creating platforms like this where we can talk honestly about how much of this doesn't work. Um, you know, and so much of it's out of the organization's control, and with these one-year grants, you know, we tell people, give us three to five-year commitments. Let us measure success against where we've come from, not against where we're going. And then related to that, I mean, you, you talk a lot in the book about the problem that funders are so obsessed with overheads. So, you know, and, I, and I guess, you know, explain that to us and, why, and what you It began as done. this arbitrary, subjective idea that organizations to spend 15% of their money on overhead, we should all be martyrs. We should not get paid a good salary. The problem with why we're not solving the world's problems is because I can't get good talent. It is so much, it's so difficult. And we get great young talent, idealistic people to work for us. And then they get a little older. They see their peers who they went to university with making a lot of money in the private sector. They start to have children of their own. They have different needs. And we need to be able to retain top talent. That's the number one thing to help an organization grow. Um, and unfortunately, people, it's considered overhead in our business, which, makes, which who cares what it is. So we're proud to say that we spend 65% of our budget annually just on people. Good salaries so we can get the top people to raise our kids. Good benefits so they can feel safe and focus on their, you know, good, good, good um, policy so they can take their children to school on the first day, just like any of us might would want to do. Um, and that's really the key. And we're so scared as, as organizations to, to speak about these issues. And the media has done a terrible job portraying this. Um, I remember Wolf Blitzer just grabbing hold of this idea that the Boys and Club Girl, Girls Club of uh, the United States CEO is making over a million US dollars. So, well, first of all, 
that's, it was, this is a person who worked for 35 years there, it was deferred salary, they're managing a budget of over 400 million US dollars. I mean, you don't want an idiot running this thing. This is a lot of money, you know, this woman had done an extraordinary job. And we need to have deeper, more intellectual conversations about this. The people who are telling us we should run more like businesses are the same ones who tell us we can't pay our staff. Uh, you've actually managed to get some funders to... It's interesting, so a young guy who, um, I actually met him at university and he had come from, uh, um, poverty and made it on a scholarship to university and since made a huge amount of money as a hedge fund manager and he knows nothing about philanthropy but he came to me and said I want to give you a half million dollars you tell me how we you can most change your organization and I just thought about it and said well we need to retain our talent so we created a vesting program for uh, 15 individuals within the organization um, and we have a pool that we can bring more people into it who we are now locked in for the next five years and it's just a, what a great use that's how we grow a company that makes sense. And has that, and has that completely changed their attitude? We just started two right. weeks ago, so I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so in the in the in the book, there's a, and I, we haven't talked too much about all the contents of the book because we didn't want to stop you buying copies. But um, uh, there's this nice vignette of you talking to President Clinton. Um, and I mean, you and I both have had conversations with him, and I, he wrote the forward for my book in the end. But I'm interested, firstly, I mean, you see his role as a very positive role, firstly, I mean, and this has become quite controversial in America at the moment, the role of the CG, the Clinton Global Initiative, and you know, whether it's, a, you know, in fact, a sort of political front organization for Hillary and all that sort of thing. I think it's far from any sort of political front, mm. I really do. Mm. Um, I think he's done an extraordinary job of creating a platform to bring together great industry, nonprofit sector, government, to have discussions, to just intermingle over four days. I mean, if you're in the sector, you want to be there for those four days, um, help access capital. Um, there's a lot of issues there, of course, but I think overall they've done a terrific job. And the, the, the part in the book is when um, I was working on his advisory committee and he had a breakfast for 40 of us and then he had sat with each of us for 10 minutes. He said, what do you think of my speech to me? And I said, I thought it was excellent, sir. And he's like, Jacob, I didn't bring you here to tell me it was excellent. And I'm like, okay, but, you know, I was very scared. I was like, what am I going to say to him? So I said, the truth is, is that, you know, you claim to reach 400 million, have reached 400 million people over eight years. And I thought that was quite irresponsible of you. Imagine if you had said to this room, we've reached, we've changed the lives of 50,000 people. You've just set the tone of what impact is. And I think too often we, we, we need this need for bigger and bigger numbers um, distorts the reality. And it's, it dehumanizes us of what we're actually dealing with. Because they did this project last year to mark their 10th anniversary where they got a uh, sort of outside firm to evaluate every project that had been committed to at the Clinton Global Initiative. And I mean, I thought initially that was a very good thing to do and brave, but I think in some ways it was. But essentially the measure of impact they used was lives touched, which um, as, a, as a sort of concrete term is about as soggy as you could possibly <laughs> imagine. And unfortunately, I mean, that is, that, that is a problem. So how do you, I mean, what do, what do we do about that problem? I mean, because I guess people do want to feel there's a sense of something happening that they, I mean, particularly funders want to feel they are getting something for their giving. I just think with the height giving. social media, all this, we're so aware and sensitive to everything happening in the world, it's incredibly overwhelming. Mm. And we're looking for solutions that are just going to blanket it. But there's no magic in raising children. It's just hard work, right? Every day. And you have to, and there are plenty of initiatives that are just focused, that do what they do and do it well, that stay geographic focused, and we need to help promote these. So I'm just so sick. I mean, every time the Financial Times or New York Times does their annual charity, it's the same people they're recycling they're going to interview, and they're the same organizations that are simply about growing their brand, going to scale, and we need to, and that's why I said I think the media needs to do a better job of promoting organizations that are driving truly, and listen, I want organizations to prove their impact. I want us to be as efficient as possible. But the truth is, it's, it's um, the number one question I'm asked every day when I'm fundraising is, you know, how many kids do you get for $10,000? Or, you know, how do you, we love what you're doing, but how can you reach more kids for less money? And the truth is, we spend up to 10,000 US dollars on our zero to three year olds. It goes down from there. But that's what we found it actually costs to take a child in that environment and make sure they're getting the proper meals, make sure their parents are moving along as well, make sure their house is stable. And 
You can say that's a lot, that's a little, but that's what we've proven to actually work, to take a child and keep them on track. So I think some people here probably are in that mode where they have to go and raise money for ideas that could have impact. Um, you know, what have you learned? You know, what tips can you share in terms of you know, how you actually get money out of some of these rich people that uh, you know, could actually you know, invest in something that is you know, not full of BS numbers but actually is really going to make a difference? It's getting to know people, whether it's from a foundation or an individual. Um, it's people, it's relationship building and being honest and taking them along on the journey of how much, and, and I try to expose myself, and I, the book I've exposed myself a lot, and I try to engage with people and show people how hard this is, how difficult. So give me a sense of that, I mean, you say get to, I mean, how many people are in your funder universe, how much money, I mean, you're getting right, so five million a five year. Five to six million a year, yeah. we need to grow that to about seven, eight in the next few years to hit our targets. Um, we have about 3,000 donors, but we have about 140 donors that make up 90% of our um, mm. funding base. Um, and so when I'm not, you know, I'm no, now from an operations standpoint, I'm no longer involved in day-to-day -day operations. We have an incredible team. It's running better than I could ever run. I'm not a good teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm too easy on our kids and so forth. And um, I spend a lot of time fundraising, a lot of time speaking and just getting to know our investors and trying to um, get them to think long-term, make those long, you know, a three to five year commitment allows the organization to take risk, allows the organization to, um, to have the confidence where it's not just, you know, so many organizations are running on under, you know, in America, 86% of nonprofits run on under three months of cash. That's an obscene way to run it. For transparency's sake, for the first 15 years of Ubuntu, we ran on six weeks to six to 10 weeks of cash. It's no way to run an organization. It doesn't allow you to think forward. It allows you to just to think day to day. Um, so we try to, uh, we ask people to invest in the long term. So we have, you know, we ran a campaign a few years ago when I don't care if it was 10 pounds a year or 100,000 pounds a year, but commit to three to five years and uh, let us really, sh we'll make progress. Let us show you where we've come from and along that journey. And I think we have to look at metrics a lot more like that about are we learning lessons? Are we allowing organizations to try and what have we learned from that? Let us uh, publish um, sort of our findings from that in a way that, uh, shows that we've created a culture where, where it's okay to make mistakes. I, I, every organization is about creating a glossy end report where you can't find a mention. It's just, you think the world was the most amazing place. I don't know. So, I mean, before, answer, we, but... before we throw it open, I mean, just tell us, I mean, you, 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 you've talked briefly about it earlier this evening, but you know, what's your vision for your next 10 years? What, 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 what's it got in store for you? Right, it's really three steps. It's one is, driving our core operational growth, expanding our campus into a true center of excellence, continuing to build out the facility. I mean, you go to our center in the middle of the shacks, we have our high school girls doing robotics over here. You've got a barista program to train young kids to like go into these fancy safari lodges. You've got, you know, iMac, uh, Apple built the first iMac laboratory. It is as nice, our clinic, any of you would feel comfortable going in there. It's as nice as anything you find anywhere in the world. We want to continue to expand our campus as a model, let people learn from that. Um, deepen our programmatic impact, um, so forth. The second is to build up uh, about a four million US dollar operating reserve. And that just allows us to give us you know, a little more breathing room. And the, the, the second big step is to build out the Ubuntu Institute, which will initially begin with entrepreneurs in South Africa and in New York City. Um, and that's just where we feel we have the best knowledge base. And get in bed with them for three to five years with funding, expertise, help them realize their vision, help them build out. Um, and these are early stage ventures, people who are resourceful enough to get it off the ground, um, three to four year track record, uh, but committed to specific communities. We wanna, we, wanna, we wanna change the conversation to institution building. And institutions, I just would love for the Clinton Global Initiative at Davos to have a session on institution building at the community level. Because that's what I think will begin to really change the conversation. And, um, and on a personal level, it's, um, around this issue of how do we change the way people invest in disadvantaged communities. Um, this change in the conversation, this philanthropy, um, I'm really passionate on trying to figure out how to have more of an impact there. Great, and you brought in these three photographs. I think you know, we've talked about a lot of the tough questions, but give us some. So we ran a small campaign uh, uh, two years ago where we said, should your birthplace determine your future? We asked all of our three girls what they wanted to be in life. And then we took photos of them in front of their houses. We dressed them up in the outfits that they said they wanted to be. And this idea that 
that our children in South Africa have the same dreams as your children. There's one of a fireman in there, one of a little doctor, one of a lawyer, a sassy little girl who's a, gonna, says she wants to run Vogue magazine, whatever. <laughs> the point is our kids have the same dreams. And we wanted to connect to people um, in the UK and the United States who often invest in us to say to them, let our kids realize their own dreams in South Africa just like your own kids would. And it takes the same, if not more. It doesn't take less. Right, well, thank, thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.